Welcome to Good Shepherd Presbyterian Church evening service. I only have one announcement. Pastor Potter is filling the pulpit at Grace CRC tonight, so we'll miss him. Let us read from the word in which we hear from God the call to his people to come and worship. John 4, 23 to 24. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you in spirit and in truth. Our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. You, who has done great things, holy is your name. Your mercy is for those who fear you from generation to generation. Amen. We will sing together How Deep the Father's Love for Us. You can find it in the back of the bulletin. How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Please stand. Please be seated. As we draw closer to a holy God, one appropriate response is to recognize our own unholiness. And in light of this truth, we bow in repentance before God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Well, Lord, how many times this week did I dirty my hands or make my heart impure? The times are many, indeed, when I, when all of us here, let our hearts wander and fall into sin. You say, pray without ceasing, yet we cease to pray. You say, do not be anxious, yet we fret with anxiety. 
You say you shall have no other gods beside me, yet would put our hope in the power of social media or into the power of money and wealth. You say worship in spirit and truth, yet truthfully our spirit wanders, even now. Lord, we confess that we are unworthy to ascend the hill of the Lord, and we ask for forgiveness. Amen. Thanks be to God that the repentant sinner who believes in, in the Lord Jesus Christ is given a promise of forgiveness. In that forgiveness, our hands are made clean, our hearts are made pure, and we may ascend the hill of the Lord. Listen to that promise in our assurance of pardon from Psalm 34, 17 and 18. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. As part of our worship to God, we take a moment to give back to God what was or is originally his to give. For the evening service, instead of passing the offertory, we simply remind you uh, of the offertory box in the back of the sanctuary. This brings us, excuse me, this brings us to the segment in which we pray for our missionaries. Lately, we have been praying for missionaries involved with MTW, or Mission to the World. Mission to the World is an organization connected to our denomination, PCA. Uh, many of you, hold on, today we'll focus on the teams at the Dominican Republic. And many of you may know the uh, Martinez family in our church from the Dominican Republic or the DR. The Dominican Republic is a country on the island Hispaniola and is next to Haiti. The two countries share the island. The Dominican Republic population is predominantly Catholic, many of whom are not active in their faith or practice a blend of Christianity and Afro Spiritism. The teams are Christopher Andino and the Etienne family. Chris focuses on teaching and training pastors to plant churches. The Etiennes focus on church planting, um, church planting, leadership training, and mercy ministry. So let's pray for them now. Great Father in heaven, in all the world, it is only your name that is to be worshiped and glorified. We thank you for the ministry work being done in the Dominican Republic. We pray for Christopher Andino as he teaches and trains pastors. Protect his theology, protect him from temptation, and protect him from feelings of loneliness. We pray for S.I. and Natasha Etienne as they plant a church and provide for their congregants. We pray for their three sons. We pray that they grow and mature to also know the Lord. We pray that the physical needs of both teams are provided, including financial. Bless them in the Lord that their content in Christ far outweighs any anxiety of the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. We'll now stand and sing the hymn number 455, And Can It Be That I Should Gain, hymn number 455. Please stand.
You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 17. We're continuing on in our evening series through the book of Judges, and we're now entering probably a very unfamiliar part of Judges for many of us. I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon on the last five chapters of Judges. I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon reference the last five chapters of Judges. And in talking to some other Christians, I learned most people think Judges ends with Samson and didn't even know there was the last five chapters of Judges. So I am going to be preaching uh, through these chapters as well. This evening, we will work through chapters 17 and 18. I did decide, since this is very unfamiliar, I I am going to read the whole thing so that you are aware of the text and some of these things you just can't summarize. It gets really crazy here in the end of Judges, and so we want to hear what God has to say to us. But before we hear God's word, let us call upon him in prayer. Father, we do thank you for every part of your word that you have breathed out for our benefit, for our encouragement, for our conviction, for our strength and joy in Christ. So we pray that even as we work through a text that is maybe unfamiliar, maybe seems strange to us that you would open our eyes to see the the good food that you have for us in these chapters in Judges. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear God's word to you this evening from Judges chapters 17 and 18. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The eleven hundred pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, behold, this silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the eleven hundred pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith, who made it into a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me, and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, Go and explore the land. And they came to the house They came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? 
What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, this is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. And they said to him, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth, and how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtaol, their brothers said to them, What do you report? They said, Arise, and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So six hundred men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtaol and went up and encamped at kiriath Jerem in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahanedan to this day. Behold, it is west, west of kiriath Jerem. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who had gone to scout out the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now, therefore, consider what you will do. And they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and asked him about his welfare. Now, the 600 men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be priest to the house of one man or to be priest to a tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan, who turned around and said to Micah, What is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, You take my gods that I made, and the priest, and go away, and what have I left? How then do you ask me what is the matter with you? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the people of Dan went their way. And when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. But the people of Dan took what Micah had made and the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish to a people quiet and unsuspecting, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer, because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. Then they rebuilt the city and lived in it, and they named the city Dan after the name of Dan their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. This is the word of the Lord. Do-it-yourself or DIY projects have become very popular. There are entire blogs and YouTube channels just dedicated to DIY home improvement. Pretty sure my wife has read and watched them all. 
Now, people like DIY because it's, in one sense, quicker and easier than hiring someone else to do the job. You don't have to wait for their av- availability. You're not bound to their schedule. We can do it as soon as we want, at whatever pace we want. It's also cheaper to just do it yourself. We want great results, but if we're honest, we, we don't want them at a great cost. DIY also means that we are in charge and we can have everything the way we want it to be. Now, even though do-it-yourself may be easier, cheaper, and more autonomous, it's not always better. There are some projects that you should not do yourself, because when it goes wrong, it is disastrous. Unless you really know what you are doing, you should not DIY your own plumbing or electrical work. Whenever we had issues at our first house, I always got really nervous when the plumber or electrician would come over and they would open up whatever wasn't working and they would always get a scowl on their face and just go, huh. Because the people who lived in the house before us apparently tried to DIY everything and that's why we were paying thousands of dollars in repairs. Their temporary fixes only led to greater long-term problems. Now here's something else you should never DIY. Worship. Even as Christians, we can be tempted to just do-it-yourself Christianity. We think we can make the Christian life easier. We think we can reduce the cost of faithful obedience. We think we can make corporate worship more entertaining, more enjoyable, more emotionally and experientially satisfying. We think we can have God and His blessings on our terms, according to our preferences. For honest, a lot of us think of God as the Burger King who just sings over us, have it your way. But when you are tempted to do it yourself with your Christian faith and corporate worship, I would encourage you to take time again and read through the book of Judges, especially these last five chapters. Because the book of Judges is all about Israel trying to just DIY everything, especially here at the end. We've seen Israel's downward spiral into sinful idolatry through the first 16 chapters. But in these last five chapters, the author is zooming in. He is providing you with a closer look to see what daily life really was like in Israel during this period of the Judges. So there's an obvious shift from chapter 16 to chapter 17. The author's style and content dramatically changes. It's like when you're driving on a paved road and all of a sudden you turn and now you're just on a a dirt or gravel road and you can tell something is, is different here. It's a lot bumpier. So we no longer have the repeated cycle of Israel's sin, of God's judgment through external oppression, Israel's cry for mercy, and God's deliverance through a judge. Instead, we have seemingly random and strange events involving mostly unnamed Israelites interrupted by two refrains. There was no king in the land. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We will hear that repeatedly. The first series of strange events comes in chapters 17 and 18. Now, when we read through, or you just heard me read through these chapters, your first impression may very well be that this is, this is strange. This is nuts. And in one sense, that's the point. You are supposed to read through these chapters and say, what is going on? Which is why in verse 6, the author essentially pauses and says, all right, just, just so you know, there was no king 
and everyone was just doing what was right in their own eyes. And then he gets back to the story. So we had a bird's eye view of Israel's sinful idolatry, but now we get a close up view. This is what DIY worship looks like. This is what happens when God's people give lip service to God while their hearts remain far from him. When they do what is right in their own eyes and not God's. And we'll see that it does not actually make things better. So to help us see this, I'm going to walk through the three examples of do-it-yourself worship we have in this text. I'm going to explain four lies of do-it-yourself worship and then conclude with two commands that we are to obey if we are to avoid the sinful errors we find here. The first example of do-it-yourself worship is with Micah and his mother. So we read, there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now Micah is fairly common biblical name. It is a good God-glorifying name. It literally means who is like Yahweh. It is exalting the incomparable God. And so his name exalts God, but his actions defy him. For Micah is not a son who honors his father and mother. We, we learn very quickly he has stolen a substantial sum of money from his mother. Micah is also self-centered because the only reason he confesses and gives the money back is because he heard his mom utter a curse on the thief and he doesn't want to be cursed. You also see that Micah is an idolater. The carved and metal images that Micah's mother makes for him are not his first idols. He puts them in his shrine, literally his house of gods. These aren't his first idols. And he also decides to just take religion into his own hands. And he knows that in Israelite religion, you need to have a priest. So he just ordains one of his own sons. Now, Micah and his family are Ephraimites, and priests could only come from the tribe of Levi. But at that time, it wasn't very convenient for Micah to have a Levite priest. But then, when a Levite just happens to show up on his doorstep, he says, okay, now I'll just ordain this guy to be my priest, and oh, the Lord's going to be really happy because now I have a genuine Levi, Levite as my priest. See, Micah's religion is all about convenience. He'll obey if it's easy to obey and it serves his interests. Remember two things. God had dictated that Israel was only to worship him in the place that God chose. You read throughout Deuteronomy, repeatedly says, when you come into the land, I'm going to choose where my house of worship is going to be, and you all have to go there to worship me. As we see at the end of chapter 18, that house of God was at Shiloh. And this is the big contrast. For the word for shrine in chapter 17 and the word for house of God in chapter 18 are the exact same word. There is a true house of God, and then there is Micah's man-made house of God. Micah didn't want to travel all the way to Shiloh. That was too hard. So he just builds his own house of worship because that's more convenient. But Micah also knows he, he needs to have a priest to worship God, and it's supposed to be a Levite, but until one shows up in his door, he's just going to make it up as he goes along. He's okay when it's easy. But not all Levites were priests. Priests could only come from the line of Aaron, Moses' brother. But we see at the end of Chapter 18, this Levite was not descended from Aaron. Now, Micah's mother is not any better. 
At first, she may sound like a, a pretty good mom. After all, she's probably the one who named him Micah. It's a good, God-honoring name. She's eager to forgive her son, even though he deserved the curse for stealing. She even speaks a blessing upon him when he confesses. But notice that she speaks a blessing over her son, apart from true repentance. He only did this because she uttered a curse. She doesn't discipline her son. She doesn't help him offer the, the necessary sacrifices for his sin under the Old Testament system. She just says, okay, I'm going to speak the Lord's blessing. As if she can just overlook sin and God won't really care. Then she dedicates the returned still silver to the Lord, which again, sounds good at first. But she uses the silver to make a carved and a metal image. You also notice she dedicates all the silver to the Lord, but she only gives 200 pieces of the silver. Well, what about the other 900? Presumably, she keeps that for herself. Regardless, she is claiming to bless her son and honor the Lord by doing what the Lord has specifically forbidden. For the two words for carved image and metal image are the exact two words used in Deuteronomy 27.15, which says, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman, and sets it up in secret. So the Lord has said what he hates and what is an abomination, and yet Micah's mother thinks, oh, I, I think the Lord's going to love this. I'm going to speak blessing. So Micah and his mother are guilty of syncretism. You may have thought as we were reading through Judges that Israel's idolatry was just always obvious, blatant apostasy, that they just totally rejected anything to do with the Mosaic law to just worship Baals. Now they did worship Baals and false gods. They did have idols, but they also tried to throw in some Yahweh worship too. They still did some of the things the law required, and they just kind of tried to mash it all together. They did law-like things while they broke the law. So that's Micah and his mother. The second example is the Levite. In 17 verse 7, we meet an unnamed Levite who was at first in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, you probably know, is a very important city. This is where King David will be born, that righteous king that Israel is lacking at this time. And you know from the book of Ruth that Actually, during the days of the judges in the town of Bethlehem, God was already working to provide that righteous king through Ruth and Boaz. But the Levite was not content to live in Bethlehem, and so he started looking for a new home. For false worship always leaves the sphere of God's saving work, thinking there's something better. But on his journey, he happens to meet Micah. And even though he's not a descendant of Aaron, when Micah says, I want you to be the priest, he says, okay, that sounds good. Why? Because he sees the law and he sees worship as a means for his selfish gain. He's not interested in serving God, but he'll do religious things if that will bring him earthly security and prosperity. Because if we're honest, religion can pay. It was true in those days. It was true in Paul's day when Paul warned that some proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Clearly, you look around and it's still true in our day. This is why David prays in Psalm 119, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. We can do Christian things for our own interest and not God's. The third example of DIY worship is the Danites. In chapter 18, we're again reminded there was no king in the land. 
And we're also told that at this time, the Danites are seeking a land, an inheritance, a home for them to live in. They needed land for until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. Now, that might make you feel bad for the Danites. Well, no inheritance fell to them. These Poor guys, God didn't keep his promise to them. Here's a tribe who has come into Canaan and they didn't get an inheritance. But then, if you remember Joshua chapter 19, you remember, no, God did give them an inheritance. And then you remember from Judges chapter 1 that the reason Dan doesn't have a, a land is because they failed to take it from the Amorites. They thought fighting the Amorites was just too hard, and so they lost their inheritance. This is why they are wandering around. See, everyone in this story is taking what God has not given them, and they are failing to take what God has given them. So what do the Danites do? They go look for a home that is easier to take. I want you to notice here, too, that the author tells the story in a, in a way that almost sounds like other parts of the Bible, where Israel is to be obedient. Like with Micah and his mother, and like with the Levite, there are law-like aspects to this story. There are some good words and phrases that are thrown about. In one sense, the Danites speak as if they're following the Lord. Because when you read this story, what does it remind you of? I think it should remind you of, of two other events in Israel's history. When Moses sends the spies to explore Canaan and give a report back, and then when Joshua does the same thing, sending spies in to Jericho. So these Danites, like Moses, like Joshua, they say, okay, we're going to go send spies to e explore the land. And these spies happened to come to the house of Micah, like the spies in Jericho came to the house of Rahab. They asked the Levite to inquire of God, and that sounds like a good thing to do. And then they do eventually find a, a land that sounds really good. It's described in terms of God's good creation. It's described in some terms that are reminiscent of the spies' report when they come back from Canaan and say, this is a really good land. But the difference here is, unlike with those other reports, the Danite spies also say, and guess what, guys? You remember when we were supposed to go into Canaan and the enemy looked really scary and bigger and stronger than us? Well, these guys have no idea that we're coming. They are peaceful. They are unsuspecting. This is going to be really easy. So the Danites, they're, they're not going to have to rely on the Lord like they had to to take Jericho or Canaan. But you'll note, or you should note, that Laish is not in Canaan. It's the why the author keeps noting, yeah, they call this Dan now, but you have to know this was Laish. They are leaving the promised land and saying, this is the land that God is giving us. So the spies return, but they only convinced 600 Danites to go and fight. Apparently, this was still too much work for most of the Danites. And on their way, they stopped by Micah's house again because the spies told them, hey, there's a lot of really cool religious stuff here. And I think if we take it, this will probably help us in our supposedly God-given mission. They think these trinkets will bring God's favor. So they take the Levite, they take the idols, they go their own way. Micah finds out about it. He chases after them. But when he realizes they are too strong for him, he goes away disappointed. The Danites successfully take Laish. They rename the city Dan. They set up their idols. The Levite and his descendants will now serve them as priests for hundreds of years, and they will live happily ever after. Until you read much later in Israel's history, that this is the location where 
Jeroboam will set up one of his two golden calves for Israel to worship. The northern tribes will completely turn away from the Lord, and this will be one of the locations that Assyria wipes out and exiles the people of Israel. So what do we learn from these three negative examples? What lies do their lives reveal to us about false worship? Well, number one, false worship tells you that it's only the externals that matter. Micah, Micah's mother, thinks I'm a good mother. I named my son Micah. She gives him a good Christian name. She speaks a godly blessing. She speaks of devotion to God. She even gives up some of her money. Micah has a whole personal house of worship. He hires a Levite as a priest, and he thinks, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. As if all God cared about in his system of worship was, make sure you've got a Levite, and that's all I care about. The Levite, too, probably does a lot of priestly religious things. He speaks priestly words to the Danites when they come. He says, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Now notice the Danites ask the Levite, would you inquire of the Lord for us? And he immediately answers that. He, he did not go and inquire of the Lord. And his answer is, is about the same as one of those fortune cookies you get from Panda Express. I actually really enjoy Panda Express, but the, the fortune cookies always amuse me because it always ends up being something to the effect of something will happen to you sometime in your life. And I think, well, yeah, I, I could have told you that. They tell the Danites to go in peace. God sees what you are doing. That's, a, that's essentially what they say. God sees you. Well, yeah, no kidding. God sees everything. That doesn't mean he approves of what he sees. Speaking the peace of God is not the same as having the peace of God. The Danites also follow the pattern of taking land that they learned from Moses and Joshua. They think if we go through the steps, we send out a spy, they come back, they give us a good report. We go, we take the land, we get some religious artifacts because we, we remember having the Ark of the Covenant. That was a really important thing in Jericho. So we'll get an ephod, we'll get some religious stuff. That will help us as we go take a land. They think external religion is true religion. As if God just cares about forms of worship and not the heart and and substance of worship. Christian, we must remember that obedience is a matter of the heart. It flows from the inside out. David acknowledges in Psalm 40, in sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. External obedience does matter. We ought to do things in God's way. But only is that external obedience right when it is tethered to a heart of true faith in and love for God. So we can come to Good Shepherd and we can, we can sing the right kind of songs. We can take the sacrament. We can have a pulpit. We can preach. We can say really godly prayers. And if our heart is far from the Lord, it does us absolutely no good. We must not trust in our external obedience. You can have a Christian name, say Christian phrases, do Christian things, and not be a Christian. Micah's name exalted the incomparable God. His life said, no, God's really just like a piece of wood or metal. His name lifted God high. His life brought God low. 
true faith and worship are born in the heart and grow outward. The second lie of false worship is that God is just a means to an end. It's clear that each of our examples believed God was, was just a way for them to get what they really wanted. And this is the heart of syncretism. Syncretism exists because what we want is just external, earthly, prosperity, blessing, and we don't care what we need to say or do to get it. So the Israelites were more than happy to, to throw in some Baal worship, throw in some Yahweh worship if it got them what they wanted. Why did Micah want a Levite for a priest? Because he thought faith and worship was just a magic formula. If you had the right ingredients, the right incantations, the right codes, you can buy God's favor. He wanted prosperity, not God. The same was true of the Danites. Why did they even bother asking the Levite to inquire of the Lord? Well, they, they just wanted success in their mission. They heard the word peace. That's all they were looking for. And so they go their way. And why, you may wonder, would people even bother making idols? I think probably for two reasons. One, it is really hard to worship a God you cannot see. <laughs> It, it, it's not always easy to experience an unseen God the way we want to experience him. Making idols made their religion more tangible. It was easier to worship with something right in front of them. But I think there's a second reason. Making idols changes the dynamics of the relationship. We are able then to make ourselves the creator and God the creation. Now, instead of us having to serve him, he can serve us. It makes us big and God small. To worship the true God, though, we must acknowledge that we are the creature and God is the creator. That we are to serve God and not the other way around. But this false way is sometimes how we view God. If we're honest, there's times where we, we, we have very little interest in God himself. But we go along with his rules when we think it will get us what we want. When religion and morality gain us power or wealth or a good reputation or respect or whatever it is we may want, well, then we'll go along with it. But what about when following the Lord brings us shame or mistreatment? Will we still obey when it costs us to obey? We sometimes worship God like he's a vending machine. See, you don't actually care about the vending machine. When you come to a vending machine, you immediately are looking inside to see what good things you can get out of it. And all you have to learn about the machine is enough to know where to put the money, what code to press, so that you can get what you want. As soon as you get it, you go away and you never think about the vending machine you, uh, again until you get hungry or thirsty again, and then you'll come back to, to get what you need next. Is this how we view God? Is he our desire or is he just an, a means to an end? The third lie of false worship is that easier is better. I've already pointed out how Micah, the Levite, the Danites, they, they all thought their way was easier than God's way. But true Christianity is humble dependence upon God. One of the reasons it's hard is because God wants to make very clear we can't do it on our own. True worship recognizes that God is God and we are not, that we cannot do anything apart from him. False worship relies on our own strength. It finds an easier route than sacrificial obedience and service. 
But easier is not always better. And easier, when it comes to worship, is rarely faithful. For Christianity is the way of the cross. False worship is cheaper, but in the end, we will lose everything we have gained from it. Micah's pitiful cry is always the end of false worship. When he says, you take my gods that I made and the priest and go away, and what have I left? When we worship the world and the things of the world, we will lose what we worship. What then will we have left? The final lie of false worship is that personal experience is clearer than God's word. See, we often justify our false worship by feelings and results. We do what makes us feel good, what feels emotional or experiential or or satisfying, and we conclude, well, if it makes us feel good, then it must be good. Or we see that some of our ways have actually met with success, and we conclude, well, this must mean that God is on our side and he is blessing what we are doing. So we try to interpret God's providence and our own experience instead of God's word. For example, Micah could have justified himself saying, Look how providential it was that a Levite just happened to show up on my doorstep. Of course God was providing him to be my personal priest. The Danites could have said the same thing about the Levite they find at Micah's home. It says they recognized him. Small world, fancy meeting you here. Clearly God wants you to come with us. Or the Levite could have said, well, God brought me to this man who happened to, to want me to be his priest. That, that's a great honor. Or now look, an entire tribe of Israel wants me to be their priest, their pastor. Clearly I'm supposed to go. The Danites could have said, well, if God didn't want us to take Laish, what, why did why did we find it? Why did it just happen to be that it was really easy for us to take? Clearly, this was God's desire. But see, God's not asking us to just make decisions based on how we feel or even based on his providence. Experience is not always reliable. God is asking us to trust his word regardless of the results, because results may vary. Whether or not you have pleased the Lord depends on whether or not you have obeyed his clear commands. Your prosperity or your suffering are not the indications of whether God approves or disapproves. The questions are, have you sought the Lord in what you are doing? Have you acted in faith? Have you obeyed his clear commands? That's what matters, regardless of the outcome. And I think churches here need to be careful. See, we can arrange worship services, we can preach sermons, we can have events that bring a lot of people in and conclude, well, the Lord must be really happy with what we're doing, otherwise we wouldn't have all this success. We could go the opposite route, and we think, huh. Look how many people are here on a Sunday evening. This must be pointless. Why do we even have a Sunday evening worship service if people aren't going to come? But what we do in corporate worship, what we preach, what we sing, what we pray, how we serve, it does not depend on what attracts people. It depends on God's word. Our job is to obey God's commands and leave the results to him. Sometimes obedience will bring success. Sometimes obedience will bring suffering. Same is true with disobedience. 
But on the final day, true worship will end with the joyful cry, look at what the Lord has done. While false worship will end with what have I left? So here then, let me conclude briefly with two commands in light of these chapters. The first command is probably obvious. We must always worship God according to his word. This is true individually. This is true corporately. When asking how we should live day to day, what we should do in corporate worship, our first questions should not be, what's going to be the most emotional, the most entertaining, the most enjoyable? What's going to be the most comfortable or attractive? Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe true worship stirs the emotions, warms the heart, awakens joy, and will attract those God is calling to himself according to whatever measure he decides. But those are still not the questions we're asking. Because worship is not about us. Yes, we greatly benefit from our worship of God, but it is the worship of God. It's really interesting to me that there are so many surveys about church and worship services and what people want, and then people write all of these articles and books on what we should do based on these surveys where people have been asked, what do you want? And yet we are coming here to worship the Lord. Maybe our question should be, what does the Lord want? <laughs> if he is the one who is being worshipped, maybe he has a preference for how he wants to be worshipped. And maybe, just maybe, he has told us what he wants in his word. So we should first ask, how does God want to be worshipped? For who we worship determines how we worship. And the answers are found in his word. It doesn't mean his word tells us every form, every style that is acceptable to the Lord in individual and corporate worship. But I do believe that the substance of worship should be uniform in every single church that we go to. Because we are to worship according to God's commands, not our preferences. Yes, there will be some differences in styles, not in substance. It's an indictment against everyone involved that the author does mention at the end, the house of God was at Shiloh. See, God had chosen Shiloh at that time as the place where his tabernacle, his Ark of the Covenant, his presence would be, and everybody knew that's where it was. It wasn't a secret. They could go and worship the Lord and inquire of him. We find that God has revealed his will and his ways in his word. It's not a secret. We know where to go. There is a king in the church. His name is Jesus Christ, and his commands should dictate our worship. But the second and final command is this, which is a little less obvious, but hopefully still true to the text. The second command is do not compromise the gospel to keep the next generation. Do not compromise the gospel in order to keep the next generation. Now, I've spoken mainly here of the selfish motivations for false worship, but sometimes Christians compromise truth and true worship honestly in the interest of, of others. They want others to embrace Christianity, especially the next generation. How often do you hear Christians talking about, oh, we, we want the next generation to be raised up and embrace the faith. We don't want to lose them. But then we start to see that, that certain beliefs and certain practices aren't really popular anymore. I don't know how many times I've heard that. We, we need to adjust what we are saying about gender and sexuality because the next generation is not going to buy. Or we need to change how we 
preach and how we conduct corporate worship because it's just not connecting anymore. Let me just offer a few responses to that. First, we need to be clear that in every single generation, many people will reject the gospel. That has always been true, and that will always be true. It shouldn't surprise us when others view us and our beliefs and our worship practices as strange or even evil. Second, we need to understand that if we change the gospel and if we change what we do as a church in order to attract others, we may succeed in attracting others, but we will have not attracted them to the true Christian faith. And what was the point? We might be raising up a lot of followers, but we will not be raising up many disciples of Jesus Christ. And third, I would say the only power that can actually save sinners and draw them to Christ is the truth of the pure gospel. And so if we water it down or we compromise it or we alter it, we have actually taken away the only power we had to change hearts. So if we desire to keep the next generation, our main task is to keep the gospel. Look at our text. The Levite remains nameless until the very end of chapter 18. And finally, the author reveals his identity. And you can tell he, he kept it secret until this point because he knew it would be shocking and devastating to his readers. This Levite, this idolater, this worship compromiser was Jonathan the son of Gershon, the son of Moses. There was no one greater in Israel than Moses. This was the top family of families. And yet here we have quite possibly Moses' grandson. It could just mean descendant, probably his grandson who is now an idolater. This may have happened as quickly then as the third generation. In less than a hundred years, Israel has fallen into apostasy. D.A. Carson once said, one generation knows the gospel, the second assumes it, the third loses it. If we care about future generations, then we need to care about the truth and we need to care about true worship. Not just practicing it, but passing it down. However, we can't pass it down if we don't practice it. So we must never waver in our commitment to God's word. We must not compromise its truth. We must not alter its practice. If we want to love others, we must love God and worship him according to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would guard us here at Good Shepherd, that you would guard the other gospel-believing churches and in here in Kalamazoo, that we would not waver in our commitment to the truth and to true worship. Help us to preach the same historic gospel that has been proclaimed for centuries. Help us to, yes, pray for and desire to see more and pe more people come and hear the word and participate in worship. We do pray that our worship would be attractive, but not because we're trying to be attractive, but because we are upholding Christ, who is lovelier than anything else that is offered in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn, which is hymn number 44, How Great Thou Art.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.